Hi everybody, my name is Sean Carpenter. I am a software engineer at Carfax, and today I'm going to be giving a brief and pragmatic introduction to concurrency in Go. So as a bit of a preface, uh, if you've never done anything with concurrent applications, this presentation might be a bit difficult to follow along. It's an inherently complex subject, and I'm gonna be going through it relatively fast as the goal is to you know, demonstrate concurrency in Go as opposed to concurrency in general. So, if you have a bit of difficulty following along, that's okay. Um, all of these slides will be available online, uh, publicly available on GitHub, as well as with all sorts of other resources to learn about concurrency in general. So, it's kind of a wordy title, but to sort of start off with, we're gonna kind of go right to left. We're gonna talk about Go a little bit, what it is, why it's used. We're gonna talk a tiny bit about concurrency. And then lastly, we're gonna go over a series of code samples here that are going to basically demonstrate a lot of the core aspects of concurrency in Go, as Go is quite a good language for that. So, oh, and lastly, um, if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to interject, although I do ask that, well, not interject, please raise your hand. <laughs> but um, if I do ask that if they are on the longer side, if they're a little more involved, I do ask you wait till the end, we'll answer questions then. But if you need a clarification on something quick and short, just feel free to raise your hand and, and I'll, I'll interrupt to do so. All right, well, let's get going. So first and foremost, what's Go? So Go is a general purpose procedural programming language designed to work well in an environment with many multi-core networked machines. It was developed at Google about 10 years or so ago by some extremely talented individuals that some of you may know, such as Ken Thompson and Rob Pike. Um, it's, it was designed to be, well, for, I guess to start off with the key features. Um, it's compiled, so you know it's compiled and then ran. Um, it's very fast. It's built on top of C slash C++, so it's not quite as fast as C, C++, but it's comparable. Um, it's a pretty easy language to pick up, in my opinion. It's got a couple of little oddities that maybe look a little bit different for um, other languages, notably the way that variables are declared and instantiated. But for the most part, if you've ever developed anything in Python, Java, C, or anything like that, learning Go, Go should not look very alien to you. It should look very familiar. Um, it's garbage collected. You don't have to memory, you don't have to allocate memory yourself or manage that, which is nice. Um, it's statically typed for those who care a lot about type safety. And lastly, and most importantly to this presentation, it has a huge suite of powerful built-in support for or concurrent application tools, basically. Um, and that's sort of the main gist for today. So, quick, why might you consider using Go? So you have a new application in mind, right? You have a new requirement from your company or you wanna develop something new and you're saying, hey, what language should I use? You might consider using Go if your application needs to be fast, if it, uses a lot, it has a lot to do with concurrency, and if your application is doing something network related. So Go has a pretty solid built-in HTTP library that allows you to make requests and set up a server relatively quickly. Um, however, Go is not, you know, although Go is a general purpose language and you can use it for basically anything, it is not a perfect language. So if your application doesn't care about performance, if your application is single-threaded, um, if it relies heavily on, so those are two main reasons why you might not consider using Go, but also if you rely heavily on generics, Go doesn't yet support generics. That'll happen probably soon. There's a lot of talk about Go too. We'll see. Um, and then lastly, if your application relies heavily on third-party packages. So Go's ecosystem is not quite as developed as that of like Python or Node.js yet. Um, you know, the sort of big behemoths in the package management world. But it is pretty good. You know, it's about 10 years old and it's got a lot of community support behind it. A lot of really powerful um, tools like Kubernetes are built in Go. But if you're really reliant on heavy third-party packages, um, Go may not be your choice. Uh, that said, of course, it is a strong general purpose language. You can do anything you want in it. So, very briefly, what is concurrency? So, you'll see this guy's name show up a lot, Rob Pike. He's a super brilliant guy, helped develop, uh, helped develop Go. Um, he describes concurrency as the composition of independently executing comp computations. And so, I know to sort of try and break this down as easy as I can, I know that a lot of people here who are very familiar with concurrent applications might shoot me side eyes for this definition, but you could kind of think of concurrency as being able to do multiple things at once, or at least being able to context switch between multiple different things, right? So it's like, oh, I have this one thing going on over here, and then I wanna go do something else, but then I also wanna be able to return to what I was doing beforehand, right? This ability to interrupt your application from within a single process, or potentially multiple processes, do something else and then come back to what you're doing. And that sort of at its core is concurrency, right? We're not, we're not working in the world of, hey, start at one and go to line 137 and execute every instruction along the way, right? We are doing things out of order, we are doing things in unexpected orders or particularly non-deterministic order. Um, 
So yeah. So a really good example of when you might consider using concurrency is in that of a, imagine you have an application that downloads images from the internet. Super straightforward. You know, we, IO operations such as HTTP requests um, spend, have you spending a lot of time basically doing nothing, right? If you want to download an image off the internet, you're looking at maybe half a second to two seconds depending on your internet speed. Um, for those who know a little bit more about CPUs and CPU architecture, that's like four to 16 million lost CPU cycles that you're just sitting there twiddling your thumbs doing nothing, right? So using concurrency, instead of just sitting there blocking while we're downloading an image, we could do something different. We could do computations on the side, say we're filtering or blurring images as we're downloading them, or we could just download more images at the same time. So in this approach, we have two, two different approaches to this. We have a single-threaded approach and a multi-threaded approach. And so the single-threaded approach, approach, obviously, you know, you're gonna have to go to the first website, say, hey, I want your image, and then you're gonna have to wait for them to get back to you, wait for you know, the electrons to cross you know, the Atlantic Ocean from their host server, wherever you are, and you're gonna sit there and just do nothing. Um, and then after that's done, you then move on to the second, and then the third. Whereas if you take a multi-threaded approach, you can just scatter bomb all the pages and say, hey, give me all of your images, and you can get things done, assuming your internet connection is, is infinite, n times faster, really. And there's some slight limitations with you know, how many, you know, there are still some CPU operations that require to spin up and organize um, IO operations, but for the most part, if you multi-thread it, you're really just looking, your main limitation is really just download speed. So with that sort of out of the way, and hopefully with the room sort of prepped for what's to come, we're gonna actually look at how to develop concurrent applications in Go. Now, are there any questions so far? Is anyone, everyone following along? I haven't lost everybody. All right, awesome. All right, so first and foremost, everyone can see this, right? Cool. Um, we're going to talk about the Go routine. So the Go routine, as it's dubbed in Go, you could think of, and this is another place that someone who's really familiar with Go might shoot me uh, side eyes, as a super, super lightweight thread. And you're, the definition of what a thread is might vary based on the context you're talking in. If you're talking about processors, low level wise, it might mean something a bit different. In this situation, we're just gonna call it a super, super lightweight thread. And setting up a thread in Go is literally as simple as adding the Go keyword to a function. So in this example right here, this is very straightforward, we have a, we're basically gonna spin up two different workers, right? and this function is called do work. Um, we're going to emulate work as basically this time.sleep for 500 milliseconds. Um, this could be literally anything. This could be downloading an image. This could be you know, saving a file. It could, any, any possible amount of asynchronous work you could possibly think about. So what we're gonna do here is our application is going to spin up two separate Go routines right at the start. We're gonna pass the number zero and one to them, and then finally we're gonna call the do work function from our main function. Now, for those who are familiar with concurrent applications already, you might spy an issue with this code. In fact, this issue, uh, sorry, this code is non-deterministic, which is bad, we don't want that. So we're gonna talk about solutions about how to fix this. So if we were to run this right here, we're gonna do go run 001 go routine dot go. Um, we have, first of all, this kind of, we have this order that may not be expected if you've never seen concurrent applications. Worker zero finishes, and then worker two, and then worker one. But if we run this again, and again, and again, we are gonna find out that sometimes not all the workers complete. That's where it'll happen. <laughs> or maybe it won't. Well, anyways, I don't know if I can prove it today, but this code, believe it or not, is non-deterministic. Sometimes you, so when the main function exits, right, when our main sequence exits here, um, all of the other separate threads in this situation, our Go routines, will be dropped off right off the bat, right? So if do work two happens, and then go do work zero and then go do work one, um, don't finish before do work two finishes, which is being run in the main thread, um, you're gonna lose those. So obviously we don't want that to happen. You know, If we wanna actually do this work in parallel, we need to coordinate this. So you can actually see this. If we were to take this do work at the top and maybe move it towards the middle, right, or at the bottom, we might start seeing that do work one never finishes, right? Because do work, even though go do work one happens afterwards, um, do work one is gonna have us finish and drop that off. So. All right, on to the second most important thing in Go concurrency, which is the channel. So if anyone, or sorry, was there a question? Did I miss that? Uh, no, no, okay. Um, the channel you could think of for those who are familiar with concurrency is basically just a queue with locks around it. It is um, capable of basically any amount of threads, any amount of Go routines can input into it, 
and any amount of good routines can exit, or rather can take out of it, and you can always guarantee that you're never gonna have duplicates, and that you're never going to take an object out twice. So, um, channels are really quite simple to make. You just, uh, so we're in this situation, we create a channel called C, and we're gonna spin up two functions right here that are going to do work, basically. Um, these functions are very simple. All they're gonna do is they're gonna wait for 500 milliseconds, and they're gonna say, hey, job's done, we finished. And then X and Y right here are going to wait for those values. So this is a really, really, really key aspect right here because this right here, this sort of arrow, you know, to put values into a channel, you basically just arrow the value in and to take, uh, to take values out, you just arrow the values out. Pretty straightforward. Um, this is a blocking operation, which means that if we never, if we're expecting to take something out of a channel and we never put anything in, we're going to block forever. And I'm gonna demonstrate that in a second. So to start off though, this code is good code, it'll run. So if we do this, basically what's gonna happen is worker two finishes, says jobs one, jobs done, worker one finishes, says jobs done, and then we're done, our main exit leaves. However, if we were to, for example, um, not do this, if we were to common out this little channel right here, we are going to deadlock right off the bat because X and Y, and Go is gonna let us know, they're gonna say, hey, all, all Go routines are asleep, deadlock, this is bad, this is terrible. We'll never go anywhere because X and Y are going to block until that happens. So that is a really, really, really key aspect. And additionally, if we were to even just get rid of this function, say we were only going to put a value out to X, we're also gonna deadlock because although X will get a value, Y will never get a value. It will be stuck waiting to take a value from that channel. So, that's sort of channels in a nutshell. Are there any questions? What does make uh, represent and then can space break? Gotcha. So make is just sort of a catch-all term for Go. To, Go is an Go is not an object-based language. Um, make is sort of like a primitive that kind of works. Like you think if you're familiar with Java, sort of like a new keyword, like you know object .new or whatever. And chan is a reference to channel, and string tells you the type of the channel. Um, as Go is statically typed, uh, all channels have a types. All channels have types, which means that you can only put strings into this channel, for example. But you could also have int channels, Boolean channels, whatever. So you basically just initialize a channel that is a type string and call the C? Yep, that's exactly it. Yep. All right. So with that said, we're going to move on to weight groups. So weight groups are a really fun, cool concept, which is basically a way of coordinating um, how many jobs are left in a situation, or left in a task to complete. So we create a wait group up here, and then we're going to basically do here is we're gonna set up 10 workers, and we're gonna say, hey, go do work. And then the wait group is gonna wait for these workers to finish, and then once they are all done, we'll say, okay, we're all done now. So this is really great. So imagine, you know, I had a hunt in our sort of image downloading example, you could say, all right, I have 100 images I want, to, I want to download, and these URLs are associated with these images, right? So I could say, hey, Spin up 100 workers, each worker, you get a URL, go download that image and bring it back here. And then we're gonna wait here until all of you are done. This is exactly what this application is doing, minus the actual HTTP download, we're not doing that. And we're mocking that essentially by sleeping. And this time we're sleeping for a random amount of time because not all pages are gonna get from the same place. Or not all websites are gonna have the same loading speed. So if we run this, we get worker six finishes, worker seven finishes, and all, all workers zero to nine finish, and then we say all done. So the way this works right here is this idea called a wait group. So wait group dot add right here, add one is very straightforward. All it's literally saying is saying, hey, increment a value within wait group by one. And wait group dot wait right here is basically going to say, hey, so long as the value in wait group is greater than zero, we're gonna block. So this is a blocking call right here. And lastly, of course, if we want to increment the amount of jobs that we have available in our wait group, we also need to decrement the amount of jobs we have, and that is signified by our wait group dot done function right here. So really straightforward, every single go routine increments the wait group by one. When the go routine finishes, it decrements the wait group, and then finally, our main function right here is going to wait until the amount of jobs is zero, or the value inside of the wait group is zero. Does that make sense? I haven't lost everybody yet. All right, well, if I have, if I have lost you, you guys are too shy to let me know, so I'm gonna continue on. Um, next, we're gonna talk about another feature in Go, which is the select statement. So the select statement is really good if we, don't, if we have a, an indeterminate amount of jobs. 
Um, so for weight groups, we say, hey, we have 100 jobs. You want to spin them up. Let's go ahead and do that. Um, the weight group, a, the select statement in this situation, is basically a blocking switch case that basically says, hey, we're going to keep pulling in jobs, and we're going to keep interacting with jobs until someone tells us to stop, at which point when we stop, we're done. So we create two different kinds of channels here to start. We create a jobs channel, which is going to take in um, numbers. We have a quit channel, which is going to be our signifier. So we're using a quit channel basically right here to signify to our select statement that we're done, and it's a channel bool. So you know, you think of oftentimes channels as like, oh, they're going to take a bunch of values and they're going to exit out a bunch of values. But actually, in this case, we're only really using a channel to export out one value, and that is the flag to quit. And this is really nice because this allows us to signify, or rather to signal to our main function, hey, let's quit, let's get out of here, in a concurrent thread safe fashion. So, uh, so we're working down here. So we create our jobs channel. We spin up a function here called go create jobs, and create jobs is <laughs> is literally just a for loop. It's going to wait 300 milliseconds. It's going to pass a value into jobs. And then once it, is, once it is passed in 10 values to jobs, it's going to signify, hey, we're done. Pass, a, pass the true statement to quit. So we create a variable up here, obviously called false. And we say for not stop. And so this is kind of weird syntax. This is a go thing. Um, this is a while loop. <laughs> I know it doesn't say while, but I guarantee you this is a while loop. Um, go in their effort to be perhaps a little too simple, decided to do away with a while statement entirely. So if you want to have a while loop, you have to use the word for. Eh, I don't know if I agree with it, but it doesn't super matter. So anyways, we have an infinite loop right here that blocks each time at the select statement. So we select with two different cases. We say either, so this is case, and this, this colon equals syntax, I should have explained this earlier, is go syntax for declaring a variable in a type inferenced way. So although Go is ty statically typed, it can, uh, it can determine those types at, at compile time. So this colon equals is basically saying, hey, guess the type, and also set it to that type. So we set case job equal to the inference type pulled from jobs, um, which of course is going to be a number. And we say, hey, job complete. And then at that point, after we, assuming we have a job, or assuming a job is what happened to us and not a quit signal, we loop back again. right? We go back to the start of the loop, and it says for don't stop, which is you know, basically an infinite loop until we signal it to not be an infinite loop. Um, it's going to go again, and it's going to keep blocking at the select statement until eventually it gets a quit case that says, hey, we're done. So obviously, you might think that if we were to get rid of this, we could have a very serious problem on our hands, right? If we were to comment this out, actually, also, I should probably run this in the first place <laughs> so you guys can see it and work. So we're going to do go run 004 select.go. So job one completes, job two completes on and on and on until eventually we're all done because our create jobs function signaled to the Boolean quit that we are done. I'm sorry, to the channel, the quit channel that we're done with a Boolean. But if we were to get rid of this, right, if we were to not have a, um, you know, a signal that, hey, we're done, we're going to actually end up in a situation right here where we're going to block. Or actually, we're, well, technically, we're not going to block. We're just going to deadlock because we can't go anywhere from here. In many other languages, Go is really nice in that Go has a lot of catches to say, hey, you have a deadlock. You're all asleep. But a lot of other languages don't have this. Um, you're basically just going to hang forever. And you probably have to assume you've got a deadlock somewhere or something similar of that nature. But in Go, it's very explicit. It says all Go routines are asleep. Yeah? Is there something more descriptive, like verbose mode? Because I mean, if you were a Go programmer, it wouldn't be obvious to you what the problems were. I believe so. Go actually has um, a static. Go has a lot of built-in stuff for detecting uh, concurrency problems in their applicate in Go applications. I haven't. I'm not going to admit I'm not the most up to date with a lot of those tools, but I do know that Go has a tool that will allow you to statically review your code. Actually, it'll actually statically look over your code and check for deadlocks. Um, it's not perfect, but it's pretty solid. I think I'm pretty confident there's probably a verbose mode that'll tell you more about this. Um, you can sort of deduce from this a little bit what's going on here. Like it says, select Go 19. We're blocking at 19, right? right? But um, yeah, I, I can't quite say more for that, for sure. But yeah, that's sort of the select statement. Any questions? I know this is a lot of material and not a lot of time. Yeah? What is percent D Pardon? What is percent D stuff like? Percent D. Oh, percent D is just, it's a, it's a printf format. If you ever used uh, like a C, like printf function, all it is is it's just saying percent D right here is mapping to the job value, which is just an int. Um, yeah, nothing Go related. If you've ever used like a printf in any language, this is this is a very C-like thing. Go, 
very much wears its, uh, its sea-like influences on its sleeve, for better or worse, um, such as it still has the A2I and the I2A function, although I personally don't know if I would. Well, even Java has a now. Yeah, Java does, yeah. Well, you know, not exactly anything that crazy. Yeah? So in the select state, is it actively testing all of the values at once from top to bottom and from the map? Mm, it, it basically, whenever, whenever, so select blocks, right? It's, it's not busy waiting, it's just, it's blocking entirely. So it's basically working on a notification system, which is where it's got all these cases and it's saying, hey, whenever a value gets pushed into one of these, whichever one happens first, it's gonna go and do that. So it's not, like a, it's not like a switch case in a traditional sense where you start off at the top, you go, hey, is the first one it? Is the second one it? It's very much literally just like a, hey, I'm waiting notifications. Whenever someone notifies this particular channel, I'm gonna do something. And you can also use select without channels, but this is the cleanest example of it, so. Yes? Um, it doesn't, so if we were to, yeah, so actually we could totally quit. Like jobs is not gonna stop this. Whenever, you know, cause each, um, each case causes us to revisit the loop again. If we were to say send quit at like the fifth value instead of the 10, we're totally gonna leave. We're not gonna wait at all. We're gonna exit the select statement and we're gonna totally leave those jobs hanging. So we could totally lose there. Um, that is one very important thing to keep in mind. Thank you, it's a good question. Um, yes? Yes. Uh, I don't know a lot about how Kubernetes is built. Perhaps we could talk about this a little bit afterwards. It's a bit more of an involved question. What was the question? Uh, how Kubernetes is using Go and concurrency. Yeah, it is, it is. That's all I can really say at the moment. There's a lot there and I probably am not the expert on that. Fortunately, we have a lot of We do, we do. I'm sure you can find some much more, uh, much more talented uh, knowledgeable people on that. But yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about semaphores. Um, hopefully if you, know, if you have a concurrent background, you know what a semaphore is. Um, and fortunately in Go, they decided not to implement semaphores directly into it. So this is actually something that's kind of fun here in that this isn't really just a tutorial at this point. This is actually a little more of a like, hey, here's how you can use, Go, how, here's how you can use Go's concurrency features in creative ways. Um, so they decided not to put a semaphore in the language, but that's okay because with its tools that we have already, notably the channel, we can implement a semaphore ourselves. So for those who don't really know what a semaphore is, a semaphore is sort of similar to the weight group we described. Well, not quite. You can think of it as, you know, if you have a lock, right, where you have one key for one door, you can think of a semaphore as having N keys for N doors. And it doesn't matter, you know, and you have a huge queue of people, right, that want to get through these doors. It doesn't matter, you know, who has what key, and you know how many, sorry, it doesn't matter who has what key. What does matter though is that if you have 10 keys, you only have 10 people in the past the door at, the, at a given point in time, right? And that's probably not even doing that definition very much justice, but pretty simply, you know, it's the idea of, hey, we wanna let N amount of people do this thing, but no more than N. Less than N is cool, but no more than N. So if someone, if we have 10 people, like in a room, for example, and we say, hey, only 10 people are allowed in, um, we have to wait for someone to leave that room before we can bring somebody else in. It's like a max occupancy. Um, so we can create a semaphore using a buffered channel. So channels, as we described earlier, are infinite, can be infinite in size, unless we specify that they're not. So in this situation, this channel can only store three elements in it, right? So if you put three elements in, you, any operation that tries to put a new element in the channel is going to block permanently until another, until one of those elements get out, right? So because of this, this works almost identical to a semaphore, um, we can use channels to do this, which is really neat. So in our function right here, we can, we can give this a run so you guys can kind of see it in action. Um, you know, worker one, so it's gonna happen right here. So worker one waits and then it enters the critical section and then worker two waits and it enters the critical section and then worker three waits and enters the critical section and then four and five and six are left waiting. The room is full, uh, sorry, full, not full. The room is full. There are three people in it and they're doing work and workers four, five, and six cannot enter until worker one, two, or three leaves. So worker four, five, and six are waiting and then worker one eventually leaves and then immediately worker four gets in the room. And then worker seven is waiting and then worker two leaves and then worker five gets in the room, right? This is a semaphore, very much manifest. So the way that we build this up right here is starting from the top, we first create a semaphore channel or it's a, it's a channel that we're calling a semaphore. 
Uh, it's an, almost a bit of an imposter, but it's really not. Um, and we actually have here a anonymous go function. So before, we could create a function from the side, as we mentioned before, where you could just do go um, to a defined function. But we can actually just do that um, using an anonymous function, which anyone who's ever done anything in JavaScript should look extremely, extremely familiar. Um, we have a worker count, which we set to zero. Um, and then in an infinite loop, we are going to um, uh, basically sleep for 100 milliseconds, spin up a worker, and then have that worker do work, right? Um, and then, so the, so the moment that we do this go function right here, um, we actually spin off in a separate thread, of course, as this is a concurrent function call. Um, our main function, which is gonna spin that up and then just immediately go on, is going to wait for a second. Um, so if we don't have this time.sleep right here, even though we spin up this function up here, we're gonna immediately exit and we're gonna drop everything. And we don't wanna do that. So we have our main function sleep for a second. Just so we can sort of demonstrate what's going on. Um, so the really key thing that makes this semaphore work, awesome, thank you, um, is, well of course obviously the fact that it's a buffer channel, but also we have to technically put values in this channel, right? Values, channels have to have values. But there's actually nothing meaningful about the values we need to parse in there. So we're using in Go what is known as an empty struct. I really don't know behind the scenes what the optimizations like this are like, but I can tell you, reportedly, a struct takes up, an empty struct takes up zero memory. Now that's how exactly that happens. I don't know, that's complicated. But for our sense of purposes, we basically have a non-value here. That's what we're passing through. Um, which is really cool, because we essentially don't have to worry about um, you know, wasting any values when we, you know, basically putting in junk values that we don't need. So in our do work function right here, which is really the, the main attraction, we first say, hey, the worker is waiting, and then we have our semaphore, we pass an empty struct into our semaphore, and this is like grabbing a key, right? We grab the key by passing a value in. If we can get past this section right here, we have gotten in the door, we're good. So we work, we wait 600 milliseconds, and then we say, hey, we're leaving, and then we let the key go. We pass it out through the channel, and we say goodbye, we're leaving, and that's that. And so what happens is, you know, our first three workers go through do work real quick, they get right in there, and then it's not until one of our workers pushes one of the value out of the semaphore that we're actually able to let new people in. So that's a lot, that's pretty complicated. Do you have any questions real quick? I know we are, we got 10 minutes, so I can take like one. Yes? I think Go doesn't have exception handling, is that true? Go does not have exception handling in the sense of try catches, um, as you see in Java, but it's a little, it's a little tangential to my, to my uh, presentation. I'll talk to you more about that afterwards, if that's okay. Um, but that is a good topic, Go. Um, so lastly, we're gonna talk about mutexes. Um, mutexes are very straightforward, they're built into Go. Um, in fact, we actually probably should have talked about mutexes before I talked about semaphores, but here we are. Um, mutexes are basically like where semaphores have n keys and there are n doors, mutexes have one key, and they are one door. And so this is just a really, really straightforward example. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time right here because you know, what we basically do here is we set up a wait group, we set up a value, right? We set up a safe number is what we're calling it. You know, For those who are familiar with concurrent applications, if you have a bajillion threads that want to modify a value, say an, an integer at the same time, you're gonna end up with this weird situation where even though you would think, hey, I have 100,000 threads and I'm going to increment it once in each thread, I, my value should be 100,000 at the end. But of course that doesn't work that way because increment operations are not atomic as those who know stuff about concurrency should know. So in this situation, right, we handle this by using a lock, right? We wrap our um, value that we're going to increment in a lock, right? So we lock it, we increment it, we unlock it. So this is actually a really dumb example. You would never write code like this, but it really kind of shows off mutexes in this situation because, so if we were to run this, Right, we, spent, we have a for loop that goes from zero to 1,000. Each for loop spins up a go routine that increments our value by one. We say, hey, our value should be 1,000 at the end. And of course, when we run this, it is. Boom, result 1,000. However, if we don't lock around this value right here, we're gonna end up with something very unfortunate, which is a value less than 1,000. And not only that, the value is going to be different each time. You know, always less than 1,000, but different. Um, this is just due to, for those who are familiar with assembly instructions, how instructions get overwritten based with how, the, pretty much based on the fact that read operations, increment operations, and write operations are three different operations, even though they comprise the supposedly atomic, not supposedly atomic, but the believed to be atomic by those who make this mistake to be an atomic operation. Sorry, which is the increment operation. Sorry. <laughs> increment 
is not an atomic operation, basically, is what I'm getting at here. And it requires multiple instructions to do that. So we have to lock around it. So the one thing I really, really want to show off here, last and foremost, about our code is that is how exactly lightweight Go routines are. So here we've spun up 1,000 Go routines, and it's absolutely no sweat. But what if we incremented this to 100,000, right? It's nothing. Barely has any effect. Happens almost immediately. I think if you do a million, there might be a slight delay. Maybe not even. Nope, not particularly. And this has to do a lot with Go has a lot of very strong optimizations behind the scenes. Um, but additionally, just these threads are super, super lightweight. And this is sort of the idea where when people, when you call Go routines threads, they go, no, 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 not technically. Because if we were to actually switch registers to do this like a million times in the span of this, we wouldn't get anything running this fast just because there's so much time doing unnecessarily, uh, doing unnecessary thrashing between the two different, I'm sorry, between the million different um, threads going on here. So I think behind the scenes, they're not all necessarily inherently different threads. They're operating on a much more efficient uh, wavelength. But yeah, so that's it for the coding section. Um, do you guys have any questions? That's, that's the bulk of the presentation. I'm happy to take questions for what looks like the next five minutes. Yes? Absolutely. So the time sleep that you have there in the main, is essentially that's the way you implement like a timeout on there? Um, or like in, would it work if like go long and... Yeah, so long? normally, like so you're talking about this time sleep for one second. So normally, yeah, normally you'd have a better example of like, you know, because semaphores by default, right, there's no, with weight groups it's very clear. It's like, hey, when the weight group hits zero, you know, we're done. Um, but semaphores aren't necessarily always that way. Sometimes, you know, you might, you might have an indefinite amount of work. Sometimes your workers are doing nothing, and that's okay. You might think of like, hey, I am in a server that runs constantly, and I just keep taking requests, and I keep outputting results, right? And if I have no requests, I don't want to stop working, right? Um, because you one day might have more requests. Whereas weight groups are just like, hey, we're out of requests. We finished all of our work. We're done. Let's move on. So this sort of example, this is really just a... a rubbish like, hey, wait a second, just to sort of demonstrate this. But typically, you'd want to do something a little more, you know, uh, a little more sophisticated. Like, it might just be a loop that goes on forever. Um, it could be um, something that goes on until someone gives, like, a SIG quit. Um, who knows? But the situation, yeah, it's not, not something to focus too much on. Yes? And how is the infinite loop exited? Um, the infinite loop here? Yeah. So this one actually never does exit. This goes on forever. The problem, though, is that so this is running in a separate Go function, right? So this is running in a separate Go routine. This whole bit right here is. So it doesn't matter when this exits because ultimately we're going to exit when the main thread exits, right? So this is this this is this doesn't exit. It just gets dropped, basically. Garbage yeah, it's garbage collected. Yeah, see you later. Um, yes. Oh, gosh, that's a hell of a question. Um, I, haven't, I haven't done a lot with that, I'm going to admit. Um, you'll have to, yeah, you'll have to ask me afterwards. Um, additionally, I might just not even have an answer for you. I'm sorry, yeah. Um, but I would like to hear from you about that, possibly. <laughs> if you have any good things to talk about that. Um, yes? Is there a limit to the resources that, like, the Go runtime needs? Like, how you tell Java? How yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can have, I'm, yeah, I don't, I don't know directly how to do that, but I'm sure you can. Um, there's, yeah, I, absolutely. You can definitely limit that to some degree. Um, yes. Yes. In fact, I'm at one minute left, so I am going to move on to that. So some additional reading. There's some really, really good stuff here. Um, there's a tour. If you want to learn Go, tour of Go is excellent. Um, there's some really great talks by Rob Pike, who is sort of the forefather of this language. He's super talented, super bright. Um, huge fan. Um, check out all this stuff. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming. So you can email me at seancarpenter10 at gmail if you have any direct questions. But also, most importantly, the repo with all these slides and all this code is available there. It's all public. Um, I'll wait. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down just a second, but I'll come back to this so you guys can take pictures if you guys haven't yet. Lastly, I wanted to thank all the people at Carfax that actually helped me out in building this. So I wanted to thank Mike Souza, uh, Jagish3, who's not here, uh, Eric Isaacson, uh, Teo, Mark Portefey, LT here, LT here, and Phil Shute. Um, did I actually I pronounce that last name right? Shooty? Oh, okay, well, it's a good thing Phil's not here. <laughs> and of course, if there's anybody else at Carfax who helped me, 
And I didn't write your name up here because I forgot. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for coming.